please remain standing. Brothers and sisters, I bring to you grace and peace and mercy from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for, to deliver us from this present evil age, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. May the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be ever pleasing before you, O Christ, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> I bring you God's word today from the text of John's Gospel, chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. And I ask, open with this question. Have you ever suffered in your life and asked yourself, why me? Why me? Well, in one sense, it's a very standard question. It's a very normal question to ask. Suffering happens every day. Every day, people get cancer, people get sick, people die. Now, some of this suffering is self-inflicted. Smoking, for example. If you smoked your whole life and you got cancer, well, I guess you sow what you reap. However, sometimes suffering can come through no fault of your own car accidents, parents divorcing, your child's life may go off the rails. These kinds of things are not your fault necessarily and often not in your control. Now the question is a theological question and we, in seminary training we call it a question of theodicy. And in English it basically means where is God in my suffering? Where is God in all of this? It's very philosophical. Why do bad things happen? Is the ultimate question that man is trying to answer. And we see, it, we don't have to look very far to realize that we live in a world where suffering and evil is running rampant. How and why these things happen is, well, the Bible does answer this in, in some ways. It is because we live in a world that has fallen into sin. And from Genesis 3, we see that Adam and, Adam and Eve have eaten of the forbidden fruit in the garden and the world has fallen. And because Adam is our head, our, um, our, our, our diplomatic head in one sense, and we are all in Adam, we are all children of Adam, therefore all have sinned and all fall short of God's glory. As David says in the psalm, in the Psalter, Psalm 51, he says, Surely I was born into iniquity from my mother's womb. I was conceived in iniquity. And so everything in this world is tainted by sin. And sin, by definition, is the breaking of God's law. It is not just the things we do by commission, but the things that we left, leave undone, things that we know we should do that are right, and we don't do them. We sin by omission. Everything is stained by sin. <clears throat> Our words, our actions, our bodies, all countries, everything in the left-hand kingdom, I'm using that term again from last week, everything on the left-hand kingdom is everything you can see in this world, but everything in the right-hand kingdom is God's kingdom that is reigning right now, but it's invisible. You can't see it. It can only be seen with eyes of faith. And where is that kingdom breaking through? As good Lutherans, we point to the means of grace. The proclaimed and written word of God, baptism, the Lord's Supper. These are places where the kingdom of God is breaking through and you only see that with eyes of faith. <clears throat> Even if we were to go to the edge of the universe or to go to the moon, Mars, Saturn. Even in these places, death is only a breath away. The question of why we are suffering in any particular context doesn't have an easy answer. I can give you a textbook answer. The world is in sin. There's your answer. We've fallen into sin through Adam and Eve. There's your, there's your theoretical answer. But it doesn't quite answer satisfactorily how we would like it to. And there is a, another answer that we're going to look at, which is in our text today. 
And so this is the context of suffering and sin that the disciples were asking Jesus when Jesus was passing by this blind man. Let's begin at verse 1. As he passed by, he saw a man born blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? The disciples' question reflects the assumption customary in ancient Judaism that suffering could be traced to sin. And what is sin again? Sin is the breaking of God's law, the Ten Commandments. Now, the underlying concern is well-intentioned, but misguided. Misguided was not to charge God with perpetrating evil on innocent people, but yet the New Testament makes it clear that suffering is not always a direct result of a person's sin. We're just going to take a glance at another verse here. I want to just read Luke 13, 2 to 5. Let me read this to you. And Jesus answered them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No. I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No. I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. What is Jesus saying here? <clears throat> well, are there worse sinners than others out there, in here, in the church? No. And how could we ask this question contextually for us here and now? I think, um, I haven't looked at the immediate statistics, but with the coronavirus, I believe it's, um, is it 10,000 have died worldwide? Is that correct? Something like 10,000. And so you could ask the question, do you think these 10,000 who've died from coronavirus were worse sinners than everybody else? And Jesus' answer would be the same. No. But he says, I tell you the truth, unless you repent, which means to, in the Greek word, it's um, metanoieo, to change your mind is what it means. It means to, um, we call it repent, and it means, oh, to be sorry for what you've done. That's not quite right. It just means to change your direction, to turn the other way and go back. So if I said, I'm going to have a coffee, but I repent of that, I've changed my mind. That's an effective use of that word. And so if we're living in sin and we're sinning against God, we're breaking God's law by commission or omission. When we repent, we change our minds. We turn back to God and we follow His word and His way. Now, 10,000 deaths in this world at the moment from, from the virus. Sin in this world brings death. And it's interesting when we observe sin, what is sin? It's a very difficult philosophical question to try and answer. Can you point to sin, please? <laughs> but sin is an equal opportunity employer. It shows no discrimination. Now, Jesus answers this blind man situation... And the, his answer is going to profoundly shape how we view sin and suffering and our understanding of it. Verse 3. Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. I'll, I'll say that again. Jesus answered, It was not that this man had sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now, this is very profound because it indicates on one hand that God is mysterious and wise sometimes to allow his children to go through hardship and suffering so that they can experience God's mercy and power in delivering them. Now, I'm going to give a, a little example here. I hope my wife doesn't mind. But half the time I tell Passion and Alex not to do something because that will hurt them, i.e. climbing too high, running too fast, eating too quickly, speaking too much, or doing something that they should not do. But most of the time, 
I just let them do it. <laughs> For the experience of the pain that they will go through is more than what I can explain to them theoretically. As Lutherans, our question of suffering, we call it the theology of the cross. That's the, that's the Lutheran term we call it. Jesus suffered, and when we suffer, we join in with his suffering, and we take comfort that he has suffered. Now, the fact that there is sin in the world, um, that's a theoretical answer. But for Lutherans, theology of the cross is not a theory, but a reality lived. And it's lived under the cross. I can give you a theoretical answer for suffering, but will it be satisf satisfying to your soul? Probably not. And it's interesting when we look at theory and we move to practice, I could give another example. Have you ever, uh, you, you know the old story of a child with his father in front of a fire and the father says, now son, don't touch the fire, the fire's hot. And the son's like, oh, yep, no worries. And the father leaves the room and what happens to the son? What's he going to do? <laughs> he's going he's to touch it. That's right. We can't help ourselves. And what happens? He burns his hand. Tss, ah, it's hot. The son believed that it was hot, but now he no longer believes that it's hot. He now knows that it's hot. He's moved from the realm of intellectual belief into the realm of personal experience. He has tested what he believes and it has proven to be true. This is the same for God's word. When we test God's word, it is proven to be true. When we test our suffering, we don't just believe in suffering, but we know something hurts. We move from theory to practice. Love you. Good girl. When we suffer, we experience deep truths of God through His Word and we draw closer to Him. Do we not? Verse 4. We must work the works of Him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, He spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and he said to him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. And so he went and washed and came back seeing. Now, it's a bit unclear why Jesus used mud in this story and put it on the man's eyes. But there may be an echo of the creation narrative here. God makes man from dust, from the dirt. He creates a human being and breathes life into him. And so, using the same substance to heal a man, if God chooses to do that, that's okay. In fact, God can do, use any elements that He wants to bring about things for His purposes. Today, we saw God using the element of water with the Spirit coming and giving salvation. You could say God is using physical elements to bring about spiritual ends. He does this with Holy Communion. He continues to strengthen us through bread and wine. God's Spirit fills these means and the flesh and blood of Christ comes to us through these means. If God chooses to use elements to bring about His purposes, why can't He? Verse 8. The neighbors and those who had seen Him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, it is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. <clears throat> there is a lot of suffering going on at the moment. Maybe not essentially in Gladstone just yet, as much as we think. But with the coronavirus increasing day by day, I believe, I think it was on the news this morning, Spain had 5,000 new cases 
of people diagnosed with coronavirus overnight. Coronavirus, suffering. This world is full of suffering. And it's going to cost us in our suffering, emotionally, spiritually, financially, maybe psychologically. Some of our suffering is our own fault, but some of it is not. And Jesus' answer to this blind man suffering from birth is that this happened so that God might heal him and be glorified. God can heal us. Can he, at the click of his fingers, heal the world from coronavirus and bring us all to restore us to health? Yeah, I think he can. Absolutely. But will he do that? Probably not. But I think God, you, as Lutherans, we, um, we would say that God, uh, as Lutherans, we used to talk about the doctrine of vocation. God administers his grace through the doctrine of vocation. That is, he might use the vocation, and he, he will, and he already is, using the vocations of doctors and health professionals to administer his grace. The fact that we could even potentially come up with a, 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 a like, what is it called, a, um, a vaccine to heal people would be amazing. It would be a demonstration of God's grace and mercy if he did that. As he has in the past, we've come up with vaccines for swine flu and things like this. What am I saying here? I'm saying that God can use evil in such a way that brings about his purposes. Now, hear me clearly. An example of this would be Joseph in Egypt, who was sold into slavery. A horrible, sad event. God used Joseph to save the nations and many people from death. Joseph was a type of Christ, a foreshadow of the real deal who was to come. And we know that Joseph said to his brothers in that intense moment when he wept and as he revealed himself to them, they didn't know who he was, but he revealed himself, he let them in and he said these words in Genesis 50 verse 20. He says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Let me reiterate what I'm saying here. What is God doing here? What is God doing with the coronavirus? What is God doing in Gladstone? What's God doing in the world right now? God is using all things to bring glory to himself. And God even, now hear me clearly, God even uses sin and evil, not the acts themselves, because they are sin and wickedness and evil, but God in his righteous judgment of sin and evil, all things will be glorifying to God even sin and evil in God's judgment of it. And God uses sin and evil like the selling of Joseph into slavery. That is a wicked thing. Imagine what Joseph went through, going through Egypt, being sold into slavery, the abuse he probably copped, the feeling of loneliness from his family, the feeling of betrayal. But, he, but his brothers, nor did Joseph know that through this wickedness, God was going to redeem this and save the nations. What is God doing with coronavirus? Well, I don't know right now. But one thing that I do, I do see unfolding as a pastor, your pastor here in Gladstone, is I see that as of next week, all churches across Australia have been basically cancelled until further notice. And what I'm seeing is families are meeting in their homes and worshipping together as families. Fathers as the heads of their home will be leading their families in worship as they tune in online and hear God's word read to them through their phone or through their, through their smartphone t t uh, t TV or laptop. They are worshiping together in an intimate way. And it's almost like fathers have to take on that role of headship and serve their family privately at home. We're forced to do this. Maybe it will strengthen the family unit and God will be glorified. Who would have thought? But I ask you to trust in the Lord your God that he has, this coronavirus hasn't blindsided God. It may have blindsided us, but it has not blindsided our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
I'm going to finish with a couple of thoughts here. Now, some people say, I've heard some good arguments against how God uses evil to bring about good. And, and there's, some good, there's some good reasons for this. Some people say things like, how can God use evil to bring about his purposes? Now, that's just wrong. I don't accept it. That's an evil God. If he uses evil to bring about the things that he wants to do, no. And they would say, uh, I just can't accept a God like this. Well, my response or my rebuttal would be, do you want the greatest example of evil and wickedness in which God has redeemed all things for his glory, his ultimate glory? The cross. It is the place where I would say, look no further than the cross where Christ, the Son of God, is crucified. In fact, an innocent man where God became flesh and blood for you was taken to the cross by a, 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 a murderous crowd and was brutally executed and murdered unjustly. And the most horrific act of the universe was committed. But it was done so for you. It was done so, so that you wouldn't be in that place. So that the judgment of God for your sin would go on the Son. And that you would receive His righteousness and His forgiveness and His mercy. And you would be free to go. Like the blind man in our story, Jesus had done no sin to deserve that. But in fact... Christ Jesus paid the debt for the world so that all might come to believe. Jesus suffers and dies for your sin so that you might know God and be reconciled back to Him. God used that evil and wickedness against His Son so that you wouldn't be judged for your own sin, but rather receive righteousness, peace and mercy for your sin. You have received this forgiveness in your baptism. You continue to receive it in the Lord's Supper. And I know that some of you are, are uh, a little bit frustrated, perhaps maybe, or maybe you're sad about we can't meet together next week. And we're not going to have the Lord's Supper for a time. And that's okay. Because if we had no Lord's Supper, perhaps if a neighboring army invaded our country and we couldn't have services and we couldn't have baptisms and we couldn't have the Lord's Supper? Did you know that we are still saved by grace alone, through faith alone? Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. When you hear the word proclaimed to you, spoken to you, read aloud from the lectern or shared, anyone, any Christian can share the word of God. When you see it on a billboard, the Word of God is being proclaimed to you, read to you. Your faith is strengthened. And even when those who have no faith hear the Word of God, the Word of God creates faith in that person. How incredible. That's the Spirit of God moving through the means of grace. So take comfort. Take courage. That while we can't celebrate these things together, we will still celebrate them even when we are apart. Even when we're brought together by the mercy of God we, that we can join together through the internet and online in our homes. Thanks be to God for technology. And we're going to use it for the glory of God. What is God saying through the means of grace? When you hear it, God is saying, I forgive you. God is saying, I love you. Yes, you are being tested the church will be tested in this time. So stand firm on my word and on my promises that while we may fail, God will not. While we don't know the outcome, God does. And while the coronavirus is running rampant, Jesus Christ is still the Lord who reigns in heaven and on earth. So trust in him. Look to him for all your comfort and peace in this time. When we are faithless, He is faithful. 
And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We're going to stand and we're going to confess our faith in the Nicene Creed.